May I now draw your attention to focus on the first topic, that is the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the life of the church and what lessons can we learn for the future of the church. Let us regard it as a grace-filled period. Let it not go waste. May I now introduce to you the first speaker, His Excellency, Bishop Gerald John Matthias. He is the Bishop of Lucknow, India, a moral theologian and a member of the Office for Theological Concerns of the FABC. Bishop Matthias will speak for 10 minutes. May I kindly invite Bishop Matthias. Good morning. Good morning. Most of them, cardinals, archbishops, bishops, fathers, sisters, and my dear brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. The topic for us, as it is displayed here, is sorry, a post pandemic church and the body of Christ the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the life of the church and what lessons can we learn for the future of the church in Asia. Now, many things have already emerged during the country reports. And so, something that I had prepared, I have deleted because it would have been a little bit of repetition, but many of you have already uh, dealt with COVID you experienced the impact of COVID in your own countries, and then also you have sort of tackled, coped up with the, uh, that challenge. So the first part, we'll deal with a little bit of the challenge and more with regard to the opportunities that this uh, pandemic has provided us, how we can positively see and benefit from what these challenges and opportunities have provided us. Now, after that, Father Tin, uh, Jesuit theologian from Vietnam, he will deal with a little bit of theology. What theology energizes this ongoing process of the church renewal regarding the body of Christ, how the body of Christ has suffered, and yet the body of Christ has been able to heal itself through the grace and the power of the Holy Spirit. And then afterwards, I'll come back again, again in a short while, to give the certain pastoral pathways. What pastoral pathways do you foresee so as to strengthen a post-pandemic church? So, basically, this is the program. The pandemic crisis has exposed the weakness of our health and social and even political systems. And that has been worsened because of the corruption and the mismanagement of many of the governments. The continuing health concern, health concern continues because of the virus keeps on mutating. We have had different uh, uh, types of viruses in the second wave, third wave and so on. So that's a great concern. Economies have not yet recovered as a result. The pandemic had destroyed, had devastated many of the economies in every country. And the pandemic has left many unemployed, underemployed, and many of them, those who had worked, have not received their salaries. School and education systems are restarting, and yet many of the children are, have lost much during these two years of the pandemic and they are finding it difficult to go back to school and concentrate on studies because they are all the time busy with the online classes and um, smartphones and computers. COVID worsened the already terrible garbage situation with tons of medical waste, so thus worsening the uh, ecological uh, situation, ecological environmental degradation. The general anxiety over the future now, nobody is sure what exactly will happen if there's another wave. 
and so how to handle. Of course, certain things we have learnt, but then still anxiety in the families and the individuals, all that continues. The coronavirus struck both the corporal and spiritual dimensions of the family life. Stories of pain and sufferings within the families are many. In some families, almost all members tested COVID positive. Many died lonely deaths, isolated in hospitals. Others were left traumatized. Many are still struggling to understand this harsh reality. Mental health issues, depressions, trauma, and even suicides have increased. Corporal suffering has led to spiritual suffering resulting in fear, anxiety, uncertainty, helplessness, hopelessness, depression, even loss of faith in God, and some have even blamed God for the pandemic. Now, church services, pastoral activities, sacraments took a severe beating due to the pandemic. One of the most evident sufferings was the inability to attend Sunday Eucharist. Most of the services, you know, were cancelled or held online. Of course, marriages, baptisms, confessions, ordinations, burials, we could not hold uh, online, obviously. Online it could be transmitted on the YouTube, but then the actual things, many things were cancelled for a long time, and then when they were held, very few people could attend many of these services. And so the aged, the sick, the dying went through much pain and agony as a result of the priest not being able to visit them, bring holy communion for them, and even conduct decent burials. All these have negatively impacted individuals, families, church, and the society at large. And all of you have presented this very beautifully in your own country reports. Now, while the pandemic posed many challenges to individuals, families, society, and church, it also provided new opportunities and liminal space for renewal at all levels. Every problem or challenge, if seen positively, can offer an opportunity for renewal and growth. Let's see what are the opportunities that we have had. This is the positive side that has emerged from the pandemic. In the scientific and technological field, it has created new opportunities for research, especially by pharmaceutical companies to invent preventive vaccines. And so many companies have, uh, have produced vaccines which, which are used by all over the world. And this has been achieved in a record time. When physical meetings were not possible, through communication technologies, we were able to have Zoom meetings, Google meetings, online classes, live transmission of masses, and other services on YouTube, etc. So use of technology went in a big way. Pandemic has given Mother Nature a little respite too. The sky has cleared up, pollution was reduced, as flights and vehicular traffic came to a standstill for some time, though short-lived, ecological benefits were significant. Those living in highly polluted cities could breathe for some fresh, breathe some fresh air at least for some days or some months. The pandemic lockdown gave rise to new forms of business. Another positive thing, home courier services, Meals and daily necessities were ordered online, and this has been continuing. Working from home became a new style, lifestyle, and in the bargain also many served, uh, saved a lot of travel expenses, and many still continue to work from home. People from different social strata, strata castes, religions, cultures, all walks of life came together to work for the common good. Many good Samaritans came out to help the migrants, needy, the dying, and to bury the dead. There were outstanding examples of heroism, courage, and compassion in all countries. And international cooperation was praiseworthy when donor agencies like the Miserio, Missio, Kirche in Note, and uh, propaganda and many, many other, and including bigger dioceses, have reached out to poor people in poor countries affected by COVID. The pandemic lockdown created also opportunities for families to stay together. 
It's another positive thing that happened. Many families which were ra rarely meeting together, they, they, they were somehow forced, but then that became a great opportunity to spend more time with one another, give more time for reflection, prayer, relaxation, activities, sharing and growth. The church services, the church services were, had to be conducted online. Many bishops and priests made good use of this opportunity to provide online masses for the faithful as they could not come to the church. Though not a perfect and ideal way of spiritual care, it was better than nothing and helped many families and individuals to stay connected with the church and God. Online services on YouTube channels have been a new method of evangelization accessible to anyone interested. So when Cardinal Oswald Gracious, for example, was offering daily mass in Bombay, it was accessed and people from all over the world, anywhere in the world, could see. So like that it has happened to for many, many other priests and bishops who were not only offering mass but many other services like homilies and sermons and so on. So the pandemic has also forced many people to ask some fundamental questions about the meaning of life which are not often asked. What is the purpose of our existence here on earth? Many people have plenty of time to reflect. So they're asking questions and reflecting. What is our ultimate destiny? What is the role of religion? How does faith in God help in such crisis situations? Why does God permit such global calamities? What is the right relation between human rights responsibilities and freedom. Pandemics has helped us to ask questions and also review our many systems and situations, medical system, interest in social disadvantage, reaching out to the poor, basic economic issues. Also to review role of religion, role of the church itself. Some people have begun to ask, do we really need church? If you can attend mass uh, at, uh, from online, from home, if you can pray at home, is the church really needed? Going to church, that means mainly going to Sunday mass, is it really needed? Many other things have been asked. Now, as the body of Christ, individuals, families, church and environment all have suffered as a result of the pandemic. And yet, by the grace of God, and the Holy Spirit, healing was possible and all can emerge anew with new spirit and vigor. As you know, most of the COVID-affected persons have survived. There were about, according to the figures, 650 million people all over the world were affected. About six and a half million in uh, nearly 200 million, 200 million affected in Asia alone, nearly 200 million. And uh, about six and a half million people became victims of the deadly virus. That means so many people have died, six and a half million all over the world. And about one and a half million, nearly, almost nearly two million have died in Asia and Middle East. It has given all of us, nonetheless, the spiritual and psychological strength to face such realities in the future. Many of us have learned to live with the virus, whether it is Delta, Omicron, or any other variant. Many are well prepared to accept the consequences and face the challenges should the virus affect them. We have emerged as individuals, families, or society and the church at large, universal church, stronger and more resilient. So with this now, I invite Father Tin Nguyen to do a little bit of theology about the body of Christ, how the body of Christ has suffered and um, how it can heal itself. With the
We welcome Father Nguyen Aitin S.J. to speak to us for 20 minutes, and after that, we shall also welcome, welcome back Bishop uh, Matthias to the podium. My dear cardinals, bishops, and uh, sisters, and brother, part one of our discussion has presented the positive and negative aspect of the pandemic. Let's now take another look at the church again, this time in the perspective of faith. And uh, before I begin, I just want to mention that this is a teamwork. Uh, we take a lot of the theme from the OTC paper that you have in your package, uh, FABC paper 168 and 169. Many of the ideas that I'm going to present today uh, take from Bishop Cheron, Miss Estella, uh, Sister Rekha, and uh, from my conversation with uh, many of you inside, uh, but mostly outside of this conference room. In this part of our presentation, we try to describe theologically the post-pandemic church in Asia. We asked, what do the impacts of the pandemic mean for the church in Asia, viewed in her relationship to God, to Christ, and the Holy Spirit, as well as to the people of Asia as God's people? We try to describe the church from the perspective of the ones who go suffer with all the people of Asia through the pandemic, of the ones who, despite their sinfulness, put their faith in the wisdom and goodness of God, the God of history. With that disposition of mind and heart, of his incarnation, with this disposition of mind and heart and following the model of Christ, taking up a body from the letter of the Hebrews, chapter 10. A body here means the human existence. He takes it for his incarnation. Following that model, we discover a portrait of the Church of Asia that not only sheds light on who and where we are, but also invites us to repent and to thrive for its authentic expression and realization, especially when we are celebrating our 50th Jubilee and looking forward to the next. Indeed, according to the letter to the Hebrews, Christ is to fulfill God's will and to save us by way of incarnation, and more concretely, by having a body that could be offered as a sacrifice of obedience that is vulnerable to pain, to suffering and death, the summit point of which is on the cross. Based on the meaning of that body of Christ, is a mode of existence that is vulnerable to suffering, is a preparation for the Paschal mystery, and is a means for God to accompany humanity in history, we wish to present a portrait of the post-pandemic church in three broad strokes vulnerability or vulnerable bodiliness, Passover, and synodality. First, vulnerable bodiliness, a church of incarnation. Like Christ having a body, the church as a mystical body of Christ existing in this world has a own bodiliness that is vulnerable to historical changes to pain, suffering, death, and even sinfulness. This bodiliness is vividly manifested during the pandemic of COVID-19. The bodiliness of the church can have different meanings, institution, institutional, personal, and moral. Institutional sense, bodiliness may refer to the tangible and visible element of the church that referred in Lumen Gentium 8 that were heavily affected by the pandemic. In personal sense, it can also refer to the persons who are poor 
and who suffer the most during and after the pandemic. We may usually think of the poor as a multitude without personal faces. The pandemic reminds us of thinking of them as persons with real faces and names like Nazareth, and not as statistical numbers. Finally, in modern sense, the bodiliness of the church also consists in her embracing members who are sinners like us, who contributed to the devastating character of the pandemic. Indeed, the pandemic is not only a natural disaster that causes suffering. It is also caused by our excessive exploitation of nature and exacerbated by human greed, fear, indifference, egoistic individualism, opportunistic system, and so on. Suffering together with all peoples of Asia, the church lives her bodiliness and is aware of it, at least in three following manners. Firstly, the church in Asia is aware that her visible elements are prone to be affected by historical changes and need to be adapted to those changes so as for the church to be truly herself and to be able to serve the peoples who are in need of the church now in new different ways. Given that Asian peoples are typically keen on communal expressions of life, the pandemic has been striking a hard blow to the church in Asia when her external activities were locked down. But it also created a chance for the church to rejuvenate her communal expressions. Secondly, the church is aware that in her bosom or related to her, the poor of God are those most affected by pandemic. That day, the poor and the suffering are the concrete true body of Christ and best represent the church. They, the poor and the suffering, belong to the core of the church identity and existence. Given that Asia contains most of the poorest of the world, the pandemic is an occasion for the church in Asia to feel the pain of the poor as her own pain and to be more vividly aware of her being actually the church of the poor. Finally, the church is aware that the sinfulness of her members contributes to exacerbate the pandemic. Given Asia countries are the most infamous for opportunistic corruption and exploitation of the poor, even and especially during the pandemic, the members of the church in Asia do well to remember ourselves of being sinners who are in need of forgiveness, repentance, and conversion. As ministers of the church ourselves, we ask how many times we have not only frustrated the faithful, but also hurt them deeply and kept them away from the mother church. There has been always a virus in our minds and hearts, in our social convention and structures, which COVID-19 is just a catalyst for it to rage on. Therefore, the church in Asia after the pandemic, relying on the infinite forgiving mercy of God received by her members, is not only a church of repentance and conversion, but also a church who takes preventive measures to try to make sure that another pandemic of mind and heart will not happen. Second, pass over from suffering to healing, the church of Paschal mystery. Ehans was phone Bazaar said, Christ's incarnation is not an end in itself, but is intimately related to and looks forward to the Paschal mystery as its summit, expression, and fulfillment. Likewise, the vulnerability and suffering of the church in Asia only find its true meaning and value in the mystery of the cross of Christ and his resurrection. To make sense out of the pandemic, the church does not experience it simply as one catastrophe among others in history but lives through it under the lines of Paschal mystery. The vulnerable bodiliness of the church gives her the true opportunity to live the Paschal mystery of her head. The experience of the pandemic as it was could have got all the characteristics of the experience of the cross and resurrection of Christ. In fact, mystery has been lived, the Paschal mystery has been lived heroically during the pandemic 
by the poor, the church, and her members. This mystery also needs to be irreversible mark that characterizes the post-pandemic church. Not unlike the suffering servants, many, especially the poor, have suffered silently without raising voice to blame any allegedly suspected perpetrators. The same situation is still happening today after the pandemic, especially when we think of the war in Ukraine. People in the whole world, and not only in Ukraine, are silently dying and suffering because of a nonsense war that is said to derive from one man's or a few men's egoistic decision. This experience of unjust and nonsense suffering could be meaningless and in vain if we don't leave it under the banner of the cross of Christ. It is here that we find the role of the church for the people of the world. She is here on earth to go suffer with the world, but also to shed light on the meaningfulness to the dark picture of the suffering world. The church is and should be the church of the Paschal mystery. Only Christ who suffers silently and unjustly but out of love for the Father and for others can bring us that light of meaningfulness, of hope and new life. Gazing upon Christ on the cross, the post-pandemic church is not only aware of suffering and sinfulness, but also freely assumes her wounded bodiliness with obedience and love. This gazing, the interior attitude of faith, the object of which is the cause of Christ, is the decisive and the first step toward healing and salvation before any analysis or action plan, be it scientific, social, or pastoral. This emphasis on the Paschal mystery is not irrelevant at all, especially when we take into account that in many countries in Asia, the faithful are very devotional to the celebrations of the Holy Week and very keen on the spirituality of the cross. Moreover, many, if not majority of Asians have been living, in the, Pas have been living the Paschal mystery in their history of being brutally persecuted or suppressed in the past and at present. The Paschal spirit is already in their blood and bone. Furthermore, as shown in the first part of this paper, the pandemic in many senses has been the moment of grace and not only of sin and suffering. It has offered us opportunities and not only challenges. It has broken us but also strengthened us physically, socially, and in faith. The reality of the resurrection has been manifested during and after the pandemic. The risen Christ and his spirits have been very much at work in the heroic acts of self-sacrifice and care for others. The creativity, solidarity, and transformation in many aspects of personal and social life. The post-pandemic church has come out of the pandemic under the banner of the risen Lord and still needs to keep his spirit of resurrection alive and at work in her life. Maybe I should skip some of my writing. The third point I would like to present today is Synodality, the Church of the Pentecost. With his body, Christ becomes present among us, but his presence does not stop short at the physical level, but evolve to the spiritual level. In his resurrection and in the coming down of the Spirit, we experience of this form of his presence in the Pentecost, which is our experience today of Christ's presence. We would like to stress three characteristics of the Pentecost that could be applied to the synodality as well. Presence, other-oriented, and urgency. First, synodality is present. Upon receiving the Holy Spirit, the risen Christ at the Pentecost, the Upon the receiving the Holy Spirit, the, the apostles ceased to confine themselves apart from the world, realized that the world is their home. They plunged into it to meet with people 
and were able to speak in ways that people of different cultures could understand. Likewise, synodality, first of all, means feeling at home with others, profound listening to and enjoying one another's companionment. It, therefore, should characterize not only the church way of proceeding in her mission or administration, but also in her being. Secondly, the disciples received the Holy Spirit not only in the upper room where they saw the Spirit coming down as tongues of fire, but also when, when they went out to meet and talk with people. Likewise, synodality means orient ourselves to others, being ourselves by being with others. Speaking about the others, we wish to mention three objects of synodality that could be emphasized in Asia, and that has been spoken a lot during the past four days. Firstly, synodality begins at the grassroots of the family. The church should be synodal even from its domestic level. Family itself has gone through the pandemic with its own losses and revival, one side of which is the ability to form together a home, a true community of persons of dialogue, a true domestic church, and not simply a boarding house of individuals. Post-pandemic church pastoral care of family is vital for true synodal church. Associated with family care is pastoral care for the youth, whose future is a new normal world that is no way normal as before, but much affected and changed by the pandemic. Asia is a continent of large number of youth and Asian people keen on family life. This level of synodality could be one of the main focuses of the post-pandemic church in Asia. Synodality may be performed with other religions of different religions and cultures as well as we already <laughs> stated in our FABC guideline. And finally, synodality could be also applied to our relationship with nature, with the cosmos, which according to Rana, it is our body is a part of the totality which constitutes the unity of the material universe. We realize that in the pandemic, we realize that destroying nature means destroying ourselves. Being present, being present to nature enjoying its presence, listening to its groaning and pain, and walking with it in its changes and evolution are just a few of many gestures that we could do to realize synodality with nature. It is time for us not to view our custodianship of nature as one-way relationship of making use or manipulation of nature but as dancing with nature to the rhythm of the Trinity themselves, that themselves are leading. This is a take from the OTC paper. Given Asians' peculiar relationship with nature, both as deeply and constantly immersed in it and as heavily destroying it, this synodality as dancing with nature is particular urgent for the post-pandemic church in Asia. The third characteristic of synodality is urgency. We talk a lot about new normal, as if we, don't, we try to be back to the normal life. But is it really normal? The third characteristic of synodality is urgent. We see in the mind and the heart of the disciples during the Pentecost event a sense of urgency. Upon receiving, the, upon receiving the Spirit, they immediately began to speak in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Their successive missionary activities also give a sense of urgency. Likewise, in our performance of synodality, which is in no way a complacent way of being together, there needs to be also a sense of urgency. Urgency could entail, among other things, deep conviction, strong determination to spread gospel truth and value, 
heroic and self-denying sacrifice. Asia is the land of abundance martyrs in the past and at present. It is a great witness for this urgency, which together with gentleness and harmony is part of the nature of Asian people. The gospel has come to Asia by the urgency of foreign and local missionaries. Now Asian Catholics should also feel the urge to keep the gospel and its liberating force alive for their own country people and others. In conclusion, we begin with the symbol of the body of Christ received from the Father upon his incarnation, and we discover a portrait of a post-pandemic church in Asia which is closely associated with the mystery of Christ and of the Holy Spirit. The bodiliness of the church is not always an obstacle or her weakness, uh, but being aware of it is her distinctive strength. Vulnerability is a necessary means for the church to live the mystery of incarnation, the Paschal mystery, and to walk with humanity on the road towards God, the source of and goal of all things. For the New Year, I think we are thankful to you for giving us not only theological insights, but also spiritual insights. You are a teacher of dogmatic theology at the Catholic Institute of Vietnam, and also a member of the Office for Theological Concerns of the FABC. Thank you very much, Father. Let us give him an applause. After that uh, introductory presentation and then the theology, theological reflection presented by Father Tin, I would like to present a few pastoral pathways. Many of the things would be something known to you, nothing extraordinarily new, but what we need is a new enthusiasm and zeal to implement what is being presented and many things that will emerge afterwards in your reflections. A crisis moment can lead us to the liminal space or opportune time to create something new and different, something more life-giving. We need to find new pastoral pathways emerging from the huge pandemic crisis we have all faced. Some suggestions are given here. More should emerge, as I said, from our common reflection. Now, a post-pandemic church will strengthen the church in the home, it will strengthen the church in spy cyberspace, in the dig digital world, and in the church in the world at large. It will also help us in the parish church to renew its liturgies, its ministries, its leadership style, and finally also make the church a synodal church. A post-pandemic church will strengthen the church in the home. Now, the families bore, as you know, the brunt of this crisis, and it made us realize the importance of building up the faith and love in the family. The pandemic also made us extend our idea of the family to a wider circle of family because we helped neighbors, the strangers, and they became a larger family. And therefore, we need to strengthen our basic ecclesial and basic human communities. According to me, the synodal way, as well as the post-pandemic way, uh, ch uh, church must emphasize and give great importance to basic ecclesial communities or small Christian communities. It is there that communion, participation, and mission can be realized in the best possible way. Now what we need also is pastoral accompaniment and pastoral uh, promotion of dialogue and family counseling. Wounded and broken families, those suffering due to the pandemic need pastoral accompaniment by their pastors and others involved in family apostles, particularly they need family counseling, counseling the youth, counseling children, 
there are many orphans because parents, both the parents have died, sometimes there are single parents and all of them need uh, family counselling. And the dialogue and listening to each other with a sympathetic heart is essential. And the whole purpose of the renewal of the family apostolate as well as other pastoral care with tenderness is to help the wounded family to get a sense of belonging to the church and to experience unconditional love and mercy of God, that they are not totally rejected by anybody, the church is with them and for them and ready to help them. There is also need for ongoing formation and renewed catechesis that is more urgent in the post-pandemic church. We need to, we could follow Pope Francis's this is a suggestion, his catechesis to heal the world released on February 2021. The ongoing formation should include ethical, moral, spiritual, pastoral, social, religious dimensions to help families to be filled with grace and presence of God so that they can face any challenges and any eventualities in the future. Pro-life program, I feel, is very important. Although it is done to a certain extent, I think we need to, to pay more attention to it. Respect for life from the first moment of conception to natural death is to be cultivated and promoted. Families should welcome children as gifts of God. Much needs to be done in this area to remove anti-life mentality and promote a civilization of love and culture of life. My dear friends, if you are aware there are more than 150 to 160 million abortions every year. Annually, more than 150, 160 abortions taking place all over the world, 10% of them in India alone, and probably more than 10% in China and the rest of the world. Pandemic was nothing compared to the people who have died in pandemic, was nothing compared to the people who are killed by abortion. And that's why pro-life uh, movement should be strengthened in all dioceses and all countries. Then the church in the cyberspace, namely how post-pandemic church will strengthen the digital world. The internet world has entered our lives in an encompassing way and I think it can only go on. Even if they have not been evaluated systematically or in some negative effects can be reduced, Online liturgies, church activities, especially meetings and seminars, and even social action will continue, especially including hybrid formats. The online church will be part of the local church, and in a sense even of the wider global church. With this development, perhaps we can hear better and understand the world of the young, and start to understand them a bit more, they have been missing in our church life, if not the whole youth, but a large number of youth are missing and particularly after the pandemic, many of them have given up, they are not connected to the church, they are busy with their own world and so youth can be attracted if we are more uh, engaged in online and in the digital world. So the digital world, use of the YouTube and other digital media for pastoral care must be further explored. Should there be further lockdown or other restrictions or even otherwise, these must be used to help the faithful for pastoral and spiritual help and guidance so that they remain connected to the church and connected to God. We must, we should trust our young people to lead in digital evangelization. A lot of evangelization can take place uh, through the digital media. A post-pandemic church will also strengthen the church in the world at large. The pandemic has succeeded in making us aware of a deeply global connectedness or as one humanity, as one global family, and our mission to serve the entire world, at least relative to our own countries, but then uh, we are also connected to the entire world. The whole humanity is one. as they say in India, we also become aware of the zoonotic origin of the virus and how the way we relate with nature has brought us into this crisis. 
the only way to survive is to live in a more integral way together. In the same way, being church is being integrally connected to this world, to its people, especially to the poorest and the marginalized, to the cosmos, to the environment, to ecology, to the wisdom of the different disciplines, to its deepest joys and sorrows and pains. There's also need for ecological conversion. The ecological crisis is also a summons to profound interior conversion, says Laudato Si. Pope Francis appealed to us to be guided by the seven aims of Laudato Si. The response to the cry of the earth, response to the cry of the poor, the ecological economy, the adoption of a simple way of life, ecological education, ecological spirituality, and community engagement. I'm sure Laudato Si will be treated later on to the IT itself. Now, some practical things that we could follow are, while the major decisions regarding climate change, ozone layer, and very various things of environment, that will be taken by the big scientists and big uh, presidents and prime ministers. But we and our people could do some th practical things on a daily basis. Avoiding use of plastic and paper, reducing water consumption, that is not wasting water, separating refuse, cooking only what can reasonably be consumed, that means not wasting food, showing care for the other living beings, using public transport or carpooling, planting trees, turning off unnecessary lights, that means not wasting current and not wasting power, and any other many other practical uh, things we can do, says Laudato Si, number 211. The pandemic is also beckons, to be, uh, beckons us to be good Samaritans. Pandemic or no pandemic, we are always supposed to be good Samaritans. But Christ is the good Samaritan who reaches out to the needy, sick and hungry. As the body of Christ, the church must also do likewise. Pope Francis tells us, in the face of so much pain and suffering, our only concern is to imitate the Good Samaritan. Any other decision would make us either one of the robbers or one of those who walked by without showing compassion for the suffering of the man on the roadside. Fratelli Tutti 67. Very, very powerful words of Pope Francis. And I'm sure none of us want to be robbers or want to be people who will be walking by on the other side, but we want to be all, want to be good Samaritans. Now, mission is also important. From preaching, we have to move to prophetic living and witnessing. Mere proclamation and preaching has no much impact. What influences and inspires others is the witness of life. We need to be role models who preach what we practice and practice what we preach. We ought to be prophetic in our mission. Action on behalf of justice is integral part or constituent element of the proclamation of the gospel. Networking with government and non-government organizations and other like-minded people for communal harmony, social justice and peace is need of the hour in a polarized and divided society and divided world. Most of our societies are pluri-religious, pluri-cultural and multicultural. And there is so much of tension in different on the base of religion and caste and creed. And therefore, we need to create and be bridges, bridge builders, reconcilers. The church must be voice of the voiceless, must be prophetic, agents of reconciliation and peace, and a body that works for integral human development. Now, a post-pandemic church will also strengthen the parish. The parish church will renew itself, renew its liturgies. The liturgy should not be very like dry liturgy, only, only mass, only uh, and uh, preaching at the, mi the minimum. Often, many people find that our liturgies are rather dry. So we must link that with deeply with the de struggles struggles of people, especially the poorest, 
and renew the liturgies and the sacraments so that people feel connected, people feel that they are involved in liturgy, people feel that they can pray and they can later on relate what they have celebrated on Sunday during the week. The ministries should be also re renewed, strengthen new ministries that emerged during the pandemic and how they can be integrated with the traditional church ministries. Now, some of the areas that we need to concentrate more on the youth, youth ministry. Youth ministry is very important. Similarly, ministry to the elderly. Elderly is one area that is very much neglected. And so, elderly need to be taken care. Special care must be there. Also, yesterday it was mentioned, single parents. Then there are environmental issues. Then the children, street children, special children, uh, handicapped children, mentally challenged, uh, physically challenged, and uh, special able children, whatever you call them. So these, these need special attention, special ministries. Family counseling, and so on. So many other things can be done and should be done. Leadership. Build up many grassroots leaders which emerge in response to the crisis. Also collaboration of the church leaders with the other NGOs and government units. We also learned consultation with different disciplines in pastoral planning. We, 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 now we're talking about synodal way. Leadership should emerge also from grassroots level. Empowering the laity, empowering women, empowering youth. These are all suggested already, but these are very important. And therefore, what the present situation, post-pandemic church as well as synodal church, what it calls for us to do is to shun clericalism. Shun clericalism and delegate work to more and more to uh, religious and to, and to the laity, the youth, and so on, empower them. Finally, uh, synodality, just to say, from event to sense, uh, lifestyle. Synodality is not to be restricted only to certain events like this, this particular event, for example, or any other event in the diocese or during the pastoral or parish pastoral council, but uh, it must be a modus vivendi et operandi of the church. Modus vivendi et operandi of the way we live, the way we function, the way we operate at every level, in general, and in every individual Christian, in the family, in the religious communities, everywhere. That should be our, so listening to each other, discerning together, and common decision making should be our daily way of life. I think with that, I conclude and thank all of you for bearing with me twice, and God bless you. More will emerge from your reflections. Bishop. General John Matthias, I must say that you put flesh on the skeleton that was left by the pandemic. You left nothing unsaid. I wish we had more time to listen to you. And uh, you have also provided not only theological and moral insights, but also spiritual insights and also pathways for our pastoral work. Thank you very much, Bishop General Matthias. God bless you. Now we have uh, two minutes of prayer. Let us pray for ourselves and for all our people, as well as the entire human family that has undergone such suffering due to the pandemic.
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was beginning, now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. As a token of our, our thanks to Bishop uh, Jared, uh, John Matthias, and uh, uh, Father Ting, we would like to present uh, a little uh, uh, the souvenir of our thanks. Please, Father uh, Bishop Jared and Father Ting. Xin chào. Cảm ơn.